everybody. I think we're live. Beautiful. Greetings. Thanks for coming in on this uh, miracle of love, this miracle technology of love around the earth. It's a beautiful thing. Um, we have uh, some questions that have come in. Uh, I've got a, little, a few here and I'm quite happy to take them. And if there's something else that comes up for you, I wonder if that's the best position. Let's see. I'm in uh, Marin in California. And you're in Germany, America, Sweden, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, um, all over the US. It's amazing. God knows where else. You know? But here we are all together in this mutual consideration of how do we feel all that there is to feel in life? How do we dive deep into what life has given us, uh, who we are and what we are? I think all of us that have been moved to come in here and in this consideration of the new intimacy, all of us who have read the books or read some books or all of us who are inquiring into, okay, what is life and what is my life and how do I do better? We have come here in this form, in this gathering, to consider with each other what the hell we can do about it. Like I said, this is the best of times, but it's the worst of times. You know, humanity is in a crisis. And we feel that impact upon us. We feel the dysfunction in our own families. We feel the dysfunction in our own life. And we want to find a practical way through to feel better feel better and to feel better. This body to feel better. This body is a feeling mechanism. The crown is a utterly receptive, you know, as far as we know so far, it's the most receptive mechanism in the universe. Maybe there's some extraterrestrials that have a a more receptive crown than we do. But our crown is pretty awesome. <laughs> it's the most amazing machine that there is on planet Earth in terms of receptivity and computing and understanding, perception, and feeling this crown that can feel and this whole frontal line, front of the body, including the arms and the genitals, this mechanism of feeling, this machine of receptivity that we are. The human species learned how to stand upright and feel and receive and communicate. We have this amazing base and spine that is upright and a soft front. We are built for a relationship. Only, actually, when you consider it, when it gets down to it, we are only there as relationship in our natural environment. And this mind has arisen as this beautiful, amazing, perfect elaboration of the whole body, of the whole body nervous system. And the mind is there to communicate life one to another. There's nothing wrong with mind. The mind is the beauty. The mind is 
an aspect of the beauty arising in the mind is an aspect of the pure intelligence that is life arising. And the mind is a function of life that is arising. Mind is beautiful. So there's nothing wrong with mind. So here we are as this wonder that we are, this power of the cosmos is arising as this pure intelligence, beauty and function. The nurturing function of life. And we all know it. We all know it's a, just a matter of fact, you know. It's a, it is scientifically so, <laughs> it's mathematically so, that the power of the cosmos is arising as this extreme intelligence and beauty. And I always say, if I can tell you, you are beautiful, you, you are beautiful. But even more, it's true enough to be said you are beautiful, but you are the beauty. The beauty of reality arising is you. In all things in the natural world. But to get back to my point, we've noticed that we could probably feel that a little more and enjoy that a little more, this pure intelligence, beauty and nurturing function of life that we are. And we've noticed restriction, you know, we've noticed closed fist over against an open hand. Arida, the great teacher said, it can be a closed fist in life or an open hand, which do you choose? So we have gathered here around the world in this consideration of what we can actually do that is practical, that works, that is tried and true, that is proven through time, through history, through generations to this present moment. What can you actually do, what can I actually do to fix this imposition to open this close fist into a enjoyment of the radiance and the wonder, the consciousness, the awareness, the beauty that is life. What can we actually do? And this is the case all the time. And this is what's offered in this work, in this work of heart and yoga, in this work of Hindu intimacy. I'm so grateful to you for this gathering, for this sincerity, for this seriousness of coming together. I've been reading the questions and the comments and the statements, reports online and you know, there's a great transformations happening with people. For example, there's been several who've said, guess what, my husband has decided to take up practice and he's doing his seven minute wonder every day and he's promised to do it for 40 days. So I said, yay, my work is done, you know. My life is fulfilled. Somebody has responded. Somebody is taking action to heal, to feel, to participate in the conditions of reality. The condition of reality, which is strength, strong base and spine, <laughs> that is receptive to this extraordinary crown and front that is the human life, decided to do that. And it works, you see, it's not, it hasn't been made up, I didn't make this up in LA, you know, 
some yoga enterprise, some website, some marketing, and some uh, consumers, and this is the great tradition as it has evolved in wisdom culture from ancient time to this time. And you know, it's a little moment to acknowledge our teacher, Krishnamacharya, who brought this into the public life. You know, who, he lived to 101 years old and died in 1989. He's very recent. He's of our time. Many of us were alive before 1989, so he's in the same contemporary time frame. And he was the teacher to BKS Ayenga, and let's acknowledge that great personality who died very recently, two weeks ago. Just coincidentally, this is a complete coincidence, common ground is here in Marin. There's a moment, so there we go. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? What a life. What a life. Mr. Ayenga, 90 three years or maybe four years old I think. What a great life. Acknowledging him now. Very happy to do this. The quote beneath him, beneath this memorial picture, it says, it is through your body that you realize you are a spark of divinity. Wow. <laughs> so, BKS Ayanga, December 14th, 1928. No, sorry, 1918, August 20th, 2014. Pleased to acknowledge Ms. Gayanga here, who was a phenomenal student of Krishnamacharya and did a huge work for yoga, popularizing yoga around the world. The only thing is that Mr. Ainger had to leave of whatever the family circumstance. He was it was a family relationship with Krishnamacharya. Krishnamacharya was his guru, and he had to leave at the age of 21 and went to Pune and never had any further contact or education with Krishnamacharya. So these key principles from Krishnamacharya's uh, scholarship, the scholarship of the Veda of Vedic tradition and of uh, yoga was not was not able to come through Mr. Ayanga's work and the popularity of Mr. Ayanga's work that uh, ensued. So that the principles of yoga that Krishnamacharya taught are not there in the public life now. And that is our work of Heart of Yoga, to get them there. This is the work of the new intimacies, to put in place the principles that, of, and of course they're not Krishnamacharya's principles. He never made claim to them. He was a humble servant of the wisdom culture. Uh, he was simply passing on the scholarship of what he had learned from his teachers, from his guru. Rama Mohan Brahmachari and his um, family of yogis. And then his incredible son, Desikachar, the young, brilliant man, son of Krishnamacharya, who I studied with for a long time. It is time now for us to pay tribute to Mr. Desikachar, son of Krishnamacharya, in this time of Mr. Iyengar's death. Because Dasagachar too is a great, great personality in yoga and has done much to educate this world in yoga. He did so much to bring through the principles of his father's teaching and make them available. You know. And Dasagachar sadly has gone into advanced Alzheimer's. So we've lost him too. You know how it is with Alzheimer's. His body's not died, but his mind has died. So we've lost Jessica Chai, and I'd like to pay tribute to my 
my masterful teacher, Deska Chah, son of Krishnamacharya, at the same time that we pay tribute to Krishnamacharya's other great teacher, V.K.S. Ayinga. In the work of Deska Chah, he made it clear his father's teaching, and that is that there is a right yoga for every person, no matter who the person is. Krishnamacharya, if you can breathe, you can do yoga. No one is restricted from yoga. What is yoga? It is direct intimacy with reality itself. It is the, again, practical means by which any person can enjoy the power of reality that is arising as life, as pure intelligence, beauty, and nurturing. It is the primordial religious response. It is prior to doctrine. It is prior to isms, prior to political organization and power mechanisms of uh, of doctrine. So this is what we have now available to us through the work of Krishnamacharya and through this part of yoga and through this new intimacy program is each and every person's actual participation in the given, and may I emphasize the given reality, you don't have to get there, it is given, it is on you, it is upon you. There's no getting to it. Yoga is your easy participation in the given reality, and the given reality is a nurturing power. It is continually regenerating life. It is continually correcting life, making changes, healing. It requires your longevity and health and your wellness and your sexuality for the thing that Mother Nature is interested in, the one thing that Mother Nature is interested in, and that is to regenerate and evolve the species. That is the great power that is upon us. Mother Nature's only interest, God's only interest, to regenerate and evolve, improve the species. My guru, Yuji Krishnamurti, used to say, uh, life has only one interest, and that is to leave an improved version of you on the planet before you go an improved version that is well and happy, sustained and sane and free of war. Enjoying the abundance of life that Mother Nature provides, that God provides. Anyway, that's a big question we could go into present insanity going on all around us. But I believe it is uh, one person at a time, it is one village at a time, one community, one city at a time. Um, please look after yourself, care for yourself in the insanity of the human condition right now. And it will go out from there. By being intimate with your own life, you can be intimate with another in that order. And if you're intimate with another, the power of two makes the power of the third. And it goes in ever-increasing circles into a broader community. And that's why we have our Mideast Peace Project for that very reason. This uh, education, giving yoga in local community to all people everywhere, including the most troubled places. And in the most troubled places, there are dear people living, you know, men and women who are sensitive to life, who love life, who love their families, who are burdened by this imposition of human insanity that's upon them. 
And I find that in the most troubled places, people, if they're given this yoga education, they can start to teach and be with each other and care for each other, heal for each other at a local level. Care and, and soul and help each other. And this is what happens if, just at a grassroots level that is spreading out. And I think in the long, long term, as quickly as possible, let us hope and pray that the sanity will come to humanity at a grassroots level in local community from caring people who can teach each other how to be intimate with reality as it is already given to us on this earth and how to care for the planet and the ecosystems, how to look after our water systems and how to look after each other. This is our only concern, what it all comes down to. So this is this important contribution, this um, primordial response to life that later turned into religious doctrine and power mechanisms that actually like, made matters worse. It is how each person becomes intimate with their own life, their own reality, and of course there's much sublimity and bliss in this matter as you realize we are one with infinity. Later this got, this yogic experience got turned into uh, text, religious doctrine, you know, expressions of the sublime realization but confined to text and then text became an instrument of power and with the mechanism of the printed word and on and on, you know, it became geographic, um, cultural power structures, one separate from another. You know, and that's what we have today. You know, Judaism separate from Islam, separate from Christians, etc., etc., and the whole mess that proceeded from there. Rather than the very obvious realization that we are one life, we are one family, we are one. Humanity. And we have amazing differences, you know, <laughs> it makes life more interesting, you know, to go and see a, a thousand people bowing down at a mosque doing their yoga five times a day and that prayer cycle is like, wow, <laughs> hallelujah, just how amazing is your culture, how beautiful, I love it, you know, let's celebrate you, let's celebrate our difference. In our Mideast Peace Project, we have women reporting that you know, when they put their, their breath, inhale, exhale, into their five times a day prayer cycle, their, their, um, oh, just a second. Hello, Elisa, you're calling me. Oh, questions on the side. My, this is my wonderful manager, Lisa. I do not see questions on the side. They're not there. If you perhaps if you okay, no, they're not. Yeah. No, I, I they're not there. They said if you oh what why don't sit here listen. Yeah, that'd be better. Yeah. Good. Looking forward to that. Yeah, text them to me. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Thanks, Lisa. So when they link the breath to the whole body, you know, the body movement is the breath movement. The inhale is from above, the exhale is from below. The breath envelops the movement. This is the body movement. This is the breath movement. These simple principles. They say that they suddenly realize the truth of their faith. The great religion of love that is theirs, you know. And that their practice, their five times a day prayer cycle was no longer a rote practice. It wasn't just like a social patterning, a social duty behavior that they were performing 
because they had to to be in that society, but it became deeply personal and pleasurable participation in their religion of love. It became, it moved from being exoteric practice to esoteric practice. So this is what is inherent in this, you know, what Krishnamacharya called the practical means. It's that which you can do to realize the human life and the great expressions of text about the human life that have been realized in, in ancient or present times. So this, this is what you do if you have been inspired. And it could be some you know, amazing sort of religious inspiration, some person or some holy place that has moved you. But I'm just the, the ordinary human inspiration to feel more love in your life. You know, to feel more connected to life, to enjoy a relationship better. I mean, that inspiration, to meet somebody and go, oh my God, I love you. You know, like, now you're in trouble. <laughs> now what? What do you do now? So that the, you know, the pain of your mother and father don't impose upon your desire, your need to love another with continuity, just that inspiration. How do we fulfill that inspiration? And Krishnamacharya would say, without the practical means, your life will be worse. To get a taste of love, but then just have the usual life droning on, can make matters worse. So he was saying there must be this practical thing that you can do that allows you to actualize on a daily basis the inspiration that you felt. In fact, you only need to be inspired once. It only needs to happen once. This love comes knocking on your door. It's like, oh my goodness. Now what? Now yoga. <laughs> now do your practice. And it's called sadhana in the tradition. Sadhana, which is a word that means that which can be done. You can do this. Whereas you can't stay in a place of perpetual love bliss continuously from now on, or maybe you can. We won't deny that possibility once you hear that, yes, indeed, I am the power of the cosmos, arising as pure intelligence, beauty and function. You might hear that and go, oh, my God, that's it, and go into a state of permanent love bliss peace from then on possible and there are documented cases in the traditions of that happening once it has been uttered. And the Saga Data was an example where he went to his guru and his guru in Bombay, Mumbai said, you are the divine self. And he said, I had no reason to disbelieve my guru. And within three days he went into a state of permanent peace. This is what he says. So I mean, that is indeed possible, but isn't it more likely that the patternings of society of mother-father will continue? They might reduce, but they might pop up again. So the whole point of this Krishnamacharya is saying, so yoga is what you do in practical response to having been inspired. And you don't have to worry about getting re-inspired or get back there or anything or meditate yourself back to some state or other. You just do your yoga, that's all, sadhana, that which can be done. And this is what is on offer here, this is what you've been doing, is you've been doing sadhana. The practical means that which you can do to enjoy the pure wonder of reality of life that is arising as you, including all its forms, all its, all of life's ways of being in life, participating in life, including, of course, intimacy and sexual intimacy. So there was a question. Of my dear friend Elisa has sent these, and the first one. She told me, oh my God, that's a whole lot of questions. Um, so, 
Wait, like, what is the difference between? Wait a sec. Thanks. This is a big question like what is sex, what is love? And is there a difference? I think the technical answer to that, there is no difference. That sex is love. Sex is God. I have this book coming out, God and Sex. Now you get both. That is technically the case. We enter this realm through sex. What is sex? Sex is the union, the utter union, is life's intelligence. You know, here we are. The intelligence that brings the polarities together and creates new life, not necessarily as little babies, but new life. The power of one plus one makes three. So that inherent power, intelligence, and beauty of the cosmos is bringing male and female together. I think that's called sex, is it not? That is so intelligent, that is so powerful, that is so beautiful. It is union, it is a union in the context of the vast cosmos arising in this absolute reality that is upon us. So sex is love. Sex, the union of opposites, creates the mother and father nurturing force of reality and it creates new life in some form or other, including little babies. And we know when the baby comes out, like pure love, it's oh my God, you know, it's like, where, how could you be, where did you come from? It is a God-realizing moment to see a new life. Just as it is a God-realizing moment to see a life go, you know, there's a profundity beyond our ordinary mind comprehension. So, God is, I say God's method on earth is sex, and must be honoured as so, participated in as such. The union of opposites in your own system, strength that is receptive, of course, is the union of the male-female qualities of reality. And to do this, inhale, exhale, gives us the capability of participating with each other as strength that is utterly receptive, of completely giving and completely receiving. See, that is sex. And sex must be honoured and returned to its pure function. Its pure purpose is the communication of love bliss the power of the cosmos between two people. And that's whether it's same-sex intimacy or opposite-sex intimacy, it's the same. We're all male-female strength that is receptive. So, sex is love. But it's just true enough to be said that when people participate in sexual stimulation as uh, dissociated from the male-female mutuality in the male-female cooperation, respect, friendship, then it turns into something that is painful on the body. It's just to know that. 
<laughs> sex without love is painful. And, you know, we can stimulate our sex. You know, my one teacher I had said the usual sex is masturbating in the woman, you know, the, the male conventional mind has reduced sex to that. It's just stimulation. It's not whole body, whole body respect one to another. You don't even respect your own body in the common way that sex has been popularized in the world. And then, you know, we could look into the history of why that happened in the first place, you know. So that because sex was termed, was imagined to be some sort of um, obstruction to God realization rather than the very means of God realization. Very participation in all ordinary conditions, the intimacy with all ordinary conditions reveals the source of all conditions, the absolute. So that's how we got into this mess by trying to cut it off. And it turned into uh, illness for humanity. And we can correct that now in our personal lives. So that's question one, maybe. Is that answered? I hope. It, please feel free to write in. So there's a question here from a beautiful person. saying that in intimate life and sexuality there's been many broken hearts. Her heart has been broken a number of times. I really feel for this person. And she's saying Am I not being patient enough? You know, the, the promise isn't working. Well, let me tell you, you're right to have a broken heart. The position that we're all coming from is to be heartbroken. To see how life in relationship in, in the West and in the East is simply dysfunctional in uh, human intimacy and sexuality. So you wouldn't be human if you didn't have a broken heart at <laughs> this juncture in our history. Somebody said you had to have your heart broken three times before it's permanently open, you know? When your heart is broken open enough by the wound of love to see the uh, pain all around us, when you know there's a grand potential for human life but it's not been realized by anybody, not even yourself, heartbroken. So I'd say it's even necessary in this matter that pain is the healing. Feel the restriction around your heart. The pain in the heart is the beginning of healing. It's a sign that the pranas are piercing the, the nadis. Sorry to use yogic language, but the source of life, the source of nurturing from the khridaya, khridda, the place of perfect giving and receiving, khridd, da means to give, khr, to receive, khridd, the perfect giving and receiving, the inhale, exhale of hatha yoga, of asana, strength that is receiving, of posture. By the union of opposites we know the source of opposites and so the heart begins to flow open in feeling and in that feeling you know we can in our feeling of life we can approach another and sometimes that person has got their own pain and own problems and their own you know family 
lineage dysfunction that they might project on you and oh, it's very painful to the heart. So our heart feels broken. But that pain in the heart is an indication that the life is beginning to move in you and flow in you. It's a good sign, you know. So if your heart's been broken a few times, it's all right, okay, good things are on, things are happening. And just keep doing your promise practice. Do the yoga. Inhale, exhale in the way that's right for you. And it is known that in the great tradition that this is a catalyst that will help you realize your potential in every way. And there is never a finishing point in this. Never. There's always a beginning. Every day is a beginning in intimate life. And it may be necessary to drop some people behind you where the patterns were too thick, you know, the karmas, his family dysfunction, your family dysfunction coming together in this attempt and doing your best to have a sincere relationship and both practicing, you know, and then finally realizing that the patterns are just too obstructive so you graciously and hopefully gratefully you part saying no, this is this is not allowing me to do my loving. And the heart will be wounded, broken. But that means that the pranas are flowing, you know, the flower is blooming. The lotus is blooming as the whole body. And you will then be freed up to move again into relationship. And I think that there's no way out of that because like I said that life has only one interest and that is to evolve the species. Now I'm not saying everybody needs to have a baby. It's just that that's how powerful it is. We do, we are moved to get together and there's a kind of a suffering until we are in a continuity with somebody in a flow. But for, as it was a good question last week, if for any reason that goes relationship goes and it always does go finally through death or some meet way or other then there's something that is advantageous about that and so it's just you and the universe and you're not inconvenienced by that heroic effort of purifying the life and purifying sex you're relieved of that for a time maybe for the rest of your life that that can be good that's kind of groovy so it's very peaceful you and your friends, you and life. But I'd say it must be motiveless. Because, you know, well, perhaps when we're younger, there's this push come into the quality of male female polarity. But this, the promise practice is a catalyst. And it works. And it works in time. As you experiment and take risks and try being intimate with another and definitely teach the others. I was so delighted that some women reported that their husbands had agreed to practice. Wow, this is very good. There's a sublimity there in your relationship. It's not there if you don't practice. And if you're single and you start to practice, I'm saying it is definitely a catalyst that brings out your potential. It gives you a context for for dating, no, for, for um, a context to discuss what it's all about for you and to help another person come through into realizing what they really want too and how they're going to get what they really want. You know, how to get what you really want, which is an intimate life, including intimate love, sex. So it's a new word in my book, love sex. And uh, Lisa sent another interesting question. Is 
the question is a beautiful one. So how do you live this life of uh, commitment to love without hurting your family? Well, I think it's the best thing that has happened to your family <laughs> so far. And uh, they're on to a good thing here, you know. And uh, the only way to teach somebody anything is to love them first, really love them. And, you know, I know that when there are family difficulties and so forth, you know, everyone hates everybody else. You know, the, the great Joan Rivers that died recently, she wrote a book, it's called, was it? I Hate Everybody including myself, or something like that. Um, so, you know, when there is this dysfunction or, you know, belief systems and control systems or whatever, and there's difficulties in the family, it, the best approach, I think, is short, happy visits. Love them to bits. Send them gifts. Be delighted in their company. Love them. And when you love them, then if they're interested, then you can show them what you are interested in and what you're doing. You know, you can teach them the promise because they want to feel better too. And it is a matter of education. You know, some that would be very clear this yoga is not religion, but it is useful by all religions. You know, yoga is completely useful in the Christian life, to love thy neighbor as thyself, or love thyself, be intimate with life, then you will love your neighbor. You know? In the Jewish life, in the Buddhist life, you know, come to the source of all perception, yoga. Yoga is needed. I already mentioned the Islamic example. Even if you're an atheist, you know, if your religion is atheism, you're committed to. There is no God. Well, you know, you too want to feel better. You want to have a way of, you know, feeling better in life, enjoying your life. So this is relevant to everybody. And the very big point is that it must be adapted. You must speak to everybody in the way that's familiar to them and not push views onto people. Love them, respect them, honor their background. You know, on your family background, short, happy visits, then maybe longer. And I say short, so you don't get involved in those argumentative patterns, you know. It's a good idea not to get involved in anybody's argumentative patterns. Just love somebody, you know. If you do get involved in the patterns of, whoops, here we go again. <laughs> Objects subject to the object, getting involved in this entanglement of mind and all these ideas of, whoops, there we go. Okay, do my yoga, inhale, exhale, strength receiving, back to intimacy with life, back into relationship with your family or your partner and purify it, heal it in that way. So that's my suggestion there, but um, please do teach them if you can. But you can't force it on anybody. So Krishna Macharya would say, anyone who wants to, quote again, anyone who wants to can do yoga, but not just any yoga. The yoga that is right for them, according to their body type, age and health, and really importantly, their cultural background. So good luck with that in your family. I hope they're all practicing the promise soon and enjoying each other and enjoying you. There's a question here about needs, your perceived needs. I know that's a big sort of discussion point, you know, like honoring your needs, getting your needs met in relationship and so forth and fair enough and you know your needs might be getting in the way of an intimate relationship and the needs of the other person might also be getting in the way of you know I'm not getting my needs met in this relationship you know that 
that uh, psychological way of investigating things. Well, what I'm saying is the principal need is to love and be loved. And I mean tangible, physical, whole body connection to life, including sexual connection, intimate connection. And that is the principal need. And, you know, my guru, Yuji Krishnamurti, used to say, if you know what you want, there's no power in this world that can stop you from having what you want. He said it many times. What do you want? <laughs> if you know what you want, no power in this world can stop you from getting what you want. But if you want too many things, then you won't get anything. So, like, focus. And I'm saying what we want is intimate connection to life itself, to our own embodiment, and to each other. This is what we want. And in the whole matter of, you know, needs and relationship, I think it's good to come, you know, if you are together in a sexual intimate partnership, you know, let's be honest about it. What are we here for? We're here for this intimate connection to life. There's some sort of continuity of intimacy, bodily intimacy, because this is what heals the system and allows the pranas, the nurturing force of life, to flow through us. This is what we want. To get your needs met. The autonomy that the daily yoga practice gives uh, helps us so much because it allows us to step back into ourselves, to rest in ourselves, in life itself, in life as life. And then from the position of autonomy, move to another, move into intimate connection. And we need both. We need autonomy and we need intimate connection. Let's see if wonderful Elisa has sent anything else. She's so good. It's a beautiful thing, a question asking me. Um, the term that I've apparently used um, is your significant other. And the question of um, unconditional love versus love of a significant other or um, a special other, you know. And I think that's a really good inquiry. Uh, there is no way around it. We do enter into sexual intimacy, sexual loving with somebody who is special to us, where for some reason it might be biochemical, hormonal, subtle chemistries of the body, uh, energies, Pranas, you know, call it what you will. There is a special attractiveness to a particular person. You know, a, to use a crude term, lust, you know, desire, movement to another is there. So that's why I, I call it significant other, right? And that is just a particular form of intimate connection that is to be honored, you know. And usually, of course, in monogamy, because anything other than monogamy just causes confusion and emotional chaos. So, even though other cultures have considered polygamy and so forth, which is only usually arises where women are controlled and not received. So I just make that point, usually it is monogamy, though not to be, there's no ethical argument behind this, you know, whatever is right for a person. That's just in my experience in 
being in many, many communities all over the world, it is what I see as monogamy that is peaceful, that makes this matter work. So you choose another for that purpose of uh, bodily intimacy. Now that doesn't mean that you love that person more than everybody else. <laughs> there is just love. There is love. There is the in inherent unity between all life arising, all planets arising. The one absolute condition that is arising is all planets and all insects and all stars and all humans, you know, that. There, this is just love of everything in the inherent union that is upon us. Just that in that we have a sexual partner. That's all. And we choose to go in one direction of continuity with that partner and go deep into, you know, move through the stages of romantic and biochemical excitement to you know, mature adult intimacy, you know, depth, valuing the relationship itself as the tantra, you know, as the treasure of the heart, this one relationship that you have. And paradoxically, that going deep into that direction allows you to feel intimacy in all directions. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you're going to be sexual in all directions because that doesn't work. We have no social form for that. And there might be some biochemical primitive, you know, chemistries working that guard against that, you know, we want, <laughs> we want to be certain that there is a, a place for the for your offspring to mature and you know for whatever the reasons, you know. So I think there is a significant other to be honored and lived. And that does not deny the one love that is inherent to all life, the unconditional loving of all others, all people, all creatures, all stars. And the two are bound together because the love that you share in your significant partnership expands into love in all directions. So this has been lovely. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining me in this beautiful way that we've been doing it. And I've got so much feedback. You know, we'll do it again. We'll run this course again. We'll do these dialogues again. We'll receive your questions. I love this. Uh, I say, are there any burning statements, questions, reports, issues. <laughs> a burning question that you cannot go on living unless this, this question is out there. And so please feel free to stay in the continuity of this and, and uh, be in dialogue uh, by any other means, you know. Text me, email me, Facebook me, phone me. Or come and see me wherever we go, you know, we're in the... Fiji and Tabuyuni doing the teacher training uh, on October the 5th for two weeks. I'm at Esla next week in California. So come and let's, you know, it'd be great to actually have a physical hug. Uh, you're lovely. We're, we're all friends here. We're all together in this. We're on the the same planet together in this abundant paradise that has been turned into a hell by the human mind. So let's enjoy the abundant paradise that is upon us because if we can do that, there's a chance for humanity that it can move into all villages and everybody can find a way to embrace their own reality that's there for us all. Bye for now. Thank you so much.